Lucky enough for me, a few semesters ago, one of my students was working at Fantastic Sam's. So she brought me an exothermic perm. And of course, immediately when I got this, I ripped into it, hoping to find out exactly what ingredients were included in each one of the components of the perm. And unfortunately, not so much. There's absolutely no ingredients on anything in this box. Um, probably should be illegal. Um, but in any case, I did some checking and found out that there are a couple of things that are included in a perm. And I've written one of those ingredients that you generally tend to see, ammonium thioglycolate. Now, ammonium thioglycolate is a reducing reagent. That is to say, it would take those cysteine um, residues, that the cysteine that has formed a disulfide bond, and reduce the sulfur residues within that. So we would see them becoming cysteine residues once again, taking on um, the, reduced, the reduced form of that R group. So ammonium thioglycolate would lead to reduction. Now, that would leave the disulfide bonds now unformed put the cur curlers in and reposition where those um, those cysteine residues are in three-dimensional space. Now they're in a different location. Now at that point, so this first component, um, let's look here first, this wave solution is likely got the reducing reagent. There's actually two solutions that might have that reducing reagent. And then after putting the curls in, you'll add the neutralizer, and the neutralizer is likely an oxidizing solution such as hydrogen peroxide. And that hydrogen peroxide will re-oxidize the cysteine residues, leaving them then able to reform disulfide bond, but in new places. So suddenly now your hair takes on a new confirmation um, and is now got the disulfide bonds made in the place that the curlers have dictated. So now you have a permanent, right? Um, now I did find a good website that talks a little bit about this and I've written that um, website onto the box here. It's www.elmhurst.edu forward slash tilde um, chem and then forward slash vchem book followed by forward slash 568 hairwave.html. But I'm actually going to go ahead and bring that website up for you to take a look at. And we'll just check out briefly the, some of the pictures that they've got on there. So showing you that the cysteine, what are currently cysteine residues in this image in the hair, then reforming um, and becoming reduced. And we can see in the next shot how they've been reduced um, by the reducing reagent, generally ammonium thi thioglycolate. And then further on down, we see how if you neutralize Add, or if you add the neutralizer, which is generally hydrogen peroxide, that's an oxidizing reagent, and that's going to allow the disulfide bonds to reform in their position. We're now ready to talk about those amino acids that have alcohols in their R groups. And we'll begin with the simple serine. And serine has a CH2 bound to a hydroxyl. So the R group just appears like this. And immediately when you look at serine, you'll think about the fact that it is definitely water loving. It's not the most highly hydrophilic amino acid that we'll encounter, but it is a water lover. Its three letter abbreviation is really quite straightforward. It's just S-E-R. It's one letter abbreviation additionally makes a lot of sense, um, serine. And so we re recognize that it is very polar, very water loving. It's not ionized, however, so it doesn't um, have the super strong interactions with water that we would see for an ionized R group, but it is still polar and definitely we could foresee a situation in which it would exist on a more superficial uh, portion of a protein where it might interact and in hydrogen bond with other water-loving species. 
So it usually doesn't ionize, that is, it isn't likely to lose its acidic proton, but sometimes at the active site of an enzyme, you might foresee a situation where the local electronic environment was such that something acted as a super strong base and could extract that proton, leaving the ionized form of the oxygen, and then it can react as if it were ionized. So the way we'll say, say that is it generally does not um, ionize in aqueous solution, but it can react at the site of many enzymes as though it were ionized. And we'll actually get to see that happening when we start talking about um, enzyme chemistry. So that's a, a pretty cool R group and particularly uh, depending upon the environment that surrounds it, it can act in some unique ways. Uh, let's also look at threonine. So threonine is another um, alcohol containing R group, but this one is going to immediately catch your eye because you're recognizing, and I'm setting you up to recognize, that the beta carbon in in threonine is, is also chiral. So not only are we seeing a chiral alpha carbon, but additionally a chiral beta carbon. And I challenge you to go ahead and write all of the stereoisomers for threonine. Threonine also, like serine, has a very straightforward three letter and one letter abbreviation. And it's cool that we can write down right here that it has a second chiral carbon. Before we leave this behind, please don't remember, or please remember to also write down that threonine as additional, additionally is polar and hydrophilic. Great. We'll go ahead and move along and look at our basic amino acids, beginning with my absolute favorite amino acid, histidine. Now the nice thing about histidine, well, there's really multiple nice things about histidine, but one of them is that it has a simple and straightforward one letter and three letter abbreviation. So as you might guess, it's just H-I-S as its three letter abbreviation and just a simple H for its one letter abbreviation. It, because it often carries a charge in its R group, it is very highly hydrophilic, but additionally, it's also full of polar bonds, so it's very much a water lover. It can go between two forms, its conjugate base and its acid. Its acidic form, um, or its, uh, if you will, its protonated form is called the emit imidazolium ion, and its conjugate base the, is called imidazole. And it actually, the reason that we talk so freely about the two is because they do very much equilibrate with one another in a, a pH that you would expect to see within the cell. That is to say that the pKa of histidine is extremely near neutral. And because of that, histidine is a promiscuous protein proton proprietor. <laughs> That's my fancy way of saying it's kind of a proton slut. Um, it gives and takes and gives and takes and gives and takes a proton, making it extremely reactive and very, very much an important part of the active site of so very many enzymes. So you can see why I say that histidine is absolutely, bar none, my favorite amino acid. Let's draw first the imidazole form and take a look at that. Um, and this is a nitrogen containing ring structure. And I'll be honest, it's one of the trickier amino acids to remember and to really uh, get your mind around how to exactly draw the structure. Um, so we have two nitrogens in, within a five-membered ring. And I'm trying to get this beautiful ring structure shown. And also to indicate the resonance, so you can see a double bond here and here. And in this particular case, notice that we have the conjugate base form. That is, we are recognizing that this is the imidazole form. But we could equally well draw, and I'm just gonna draw a second R group so you can look at what the imidazoleum ion will look like because this nitrogen can very easily become protonated. So this can be an NH. 
which means then that we get the interesting delocalization excuse the line there is really not very good but we get the delocalization of electrons across those uh, two bonds and we recognize that this will carry a positive charge so here's the interesting thing this imidazolium form, the positive charged form, and the imidazole form, remember that the pKa for histidine is approximately 6. So if we're thinking that we actually are in a cell, and my kitty Gabby is getting uh, into the picture here today, but if we're thinking that we really are within a cellular pH about 7, 7.3 physiological, then we're going to recognize that the form that we would would expect to exist in that pH would be the imidazole form, that it has gone beyond its pKa and has lost its acidic proton. However, also recognize that this being so very near neutral is what's going to enable histidine to be constantly shifting and ebbing and changing and fluxing at the active site of an enzyme where it can literally give up and take and give up and take a, a proton. So this is a really, really meaningful, really, uh, this is super active <laughs> amino acid. So absolutely adore it. I'm going to leave those two forms so that you can take a look at both while we go on to talk about another basic amino acid. While not quite as stunning as histidine, lysine is pretty radtastic. It has not just um, so an alpha, but not just a beta. It has a gamma, but don't stop there a delta, and don't stop there, an epsilon carbon. Look at that long chain. Now, if it weren't for the fact that on the very end of that chain there is an amino group, we would be able to say that lysine was really highly hydrophobic, but check it out. Now there's this amino group at the very end of the long chain of carbons, and so we recognize that it is going to be a very, very water-loving instead of water-hating amino acid due to the charge and, of course, the ion-dipole interaction that are enabled with it and water. Lysine has a straightforward three-letter abbreviation, but it has a really complicated one-letter abbreviation. So K is its one-letter abbreviation. Lyse, or L-Y-S, is its three-letter abbreviation. We know that it carries a positive charge at neutral pH. And we also can recognize that, hey, check this. This is not just an amino acid. This is a di-amino acid. Because notice that not only do we have the alpha amino, amino <laughs> so this is the alpha amino, but we also have not a beta, not a gamma, not a delta. That's a bad delta. There we go. Um, not Okay, yes, an epsilon. So this is a diamino acid with both an alpha and an epsilon amino group. So this is a diamino acid, and we want to write that in too. Diamino acid. Beautiful. Lysine is, I mean, it's beautiful too. Let's face it, all the basic amino acids are super beautiful. <laughs> Now, arginine, it might be like my third favorite amino acid because let's face it, it's the pirate amino acid, arg. Yes. And it has kind of a weird one letter abbreviation. It's R, arg. <laughs> so recognize the R group here as being similar to lysine. There's um, a beta carbon, there's a gamma carbon, there's a delta carbon. And then from there, there's a bond to nitrogen. And this nitrogen is then bound to another carbon that's going to be a central carbon, which then at this point, this is doubly bound to a nitrogen. This is positively charged. And then um, again, we have another, another nitrogen here. And so what's really cool and probably incredibly fitting for our pyro amino acid is it is the most base of them all. <laughs> so it honestly is the most basic amino acid that there is. What that means is that 
under every pH that is found within a cellular system, this amino acid will be protonated. That is said another way. Its pKa is so high that it is always going to be below the pKa, and therefore it's going to maintain its acidic proton at all pHs that are relevant within a cellular world which we understand that that probably means that it's going to make a very large contribution to the overall charge of proteins um, and namely to the negative charge. If we see a protein that is rich in arginine, we can say that it is going to be likely to be a basic protein. Beautiful. So these are our um, basic amino acids, and I don't want to leave out the acidic amino acids, so we'll turn our attention next to looking at those. So as we now move along to look at the acidic amino acids, one feature that I want to mention is conserved is that like the basic amino acids, these are going to be highly water loving, very highly hydrophilic. And actually make sure you write that back on your notes for ARG, the basic amino acid. Uh, the, the pyrid amino acid is also very water, highly water loving, as are going to be our acidic amino acids, aspartate and glutamate. Because they have charged R groups, they are going to be incredibly uh, inter interactive with water, forming those ion-dipole interactions. So let's go ahead and draw the R groups of the acidic amino acids, beginning with aspartate. Aspartate has a relatively simple R group. It's got a CH2 bound to a carboxyl group. So C double bond O, bond O minus. No, ha, huh, look at this. This is a dicarboxylic acid because not only do we have a carb our carboxylic acid group on the alpha carbon, but there's another one on the beta carbon. So aspartate with its three letter abbreviation making an awful lot of sense, it's just ASP, has a one letter abbreviation that leaves us a little bit dumbfounded. It's D. So aspartate is a little bit unusual in that way. It's of course going to love to form interactions with with um, surrounding water molecules, very highly hydrophilic, very polar, and negatively charged at a pH of 7. Now this is going to be true for nearly every cellular pH because the pKa of aspartate is down near 3, and of course because of that, at most pHs that you would encounter in a cellular environment, most neutral pHs, this is going to be in its anionic form, negatively charged. However, I suppose if you saw an environment that became acidic, acidic enough, if we thought about like say your stomach, then this could um, cause it to become protonated. Again, it is a, a dicarboxylic acid with both an alpha and a beta carboxyl group. Now let's go ahead and take a look at glutamate. Glutamate is very, very similar to aspartate, except for that it has an, a, an extra carbon in its side chain. So rather than a single CH2, it has two CH2s, and then it's got its carboxylic acid. So now a C double bond O, bond O minus, giving us the same sort of behaviors. So we often think about the fact that glutamate and aspartate might act in similar ways in a protein where they both would act as acids, one just being just slightly larger than the other. And of course, a slight difference in local electronic environment because the length of that R group. But just like aspartate, we know that glutamate is going to be water loving to the max. It's going to love forming those ion dipole interactions with water, making it very highly hydrophilic. It too will carry a negative charge at physiological pHs well above its pKa. This time, the dicarboxylic acid is an alpha gamma. Uh, carboxyl group that gives it that dicarboxylic acid nature. So we've now met diamino and dicarboxylic acids. <laughs> the last two today that we're going to cover are asparagine and glutamine. These are the amide derivatives of the, um, of the acidic amino acids. And of course that means we know that we're going to have a C double bond O bond NH3 and so, or NH2. So recognize that that's just the amide bond added into the R group. Otherwise asparagine looks just like aspartate only only it's got the amide instead of the acid. So it's just going to be CH2 bond C double bond O bond NH2. Very polar um, and fairly water loving, but not the same kind of strength of water loving as aspartate has because it's it's got just 
polar um, bonds rather than the charged. Um, and let's go ahead and write in glutamine, glutamine while we're at it. And because we recognize that like glutamate and its relationship to aspartate, there's simply two CH2s prior to the amide group. Glutamine, asparagine. And both glutamine and asparagine are, of course, going to be water-loving. They're polar, hydrophilic, often found on the surface of proteins, where they can frequently hydrogen bond and interact with other molecules. In fact, maybe these will be even involved if a protein is perhaps binding to a receptor. So in both cases, polar, hydrophilic. Now before we leave this page behind, I want to tell you about something pretty familiar. You may not have thought about it, but you actually are pretty familiar with the amino acid glutamate, even just within popular culture. Because oftentimes glutamate will interact with a um, cation, sodium, the sodium plus cation. And if you think about this, this is a single sodium interacting with a glutamate. Mono sodium glutamate or MSG. And MSG is really quite talked about, quite a lot. <laughs> um, a little bit notorious. Brought in today, this is a, an old salad dressing I've had in my, somehow at my refrigerator multiply salad dressings. I don't know how that works. Um, but I've had this in my fridge for a really long time. And I was reading through the ingredients the other day, and sure enough, um, monosodium glutamate or MSG. Any of you guys had particular experiences with MSG? I get migraines, I think it's similarly. Yeah, to my mom does too. Yeah, Dan Siltman was in my summer class and he said the exact same thing. Um, his doctor has warned him not to eat too much MSG for risk of bringing on a migraine. Yeah, and um, this is really interesting because we actually had an extra credit question on it. By the way, good discussion on the extra credit question. Um, we had an extra credit question on it this summer. And you know there's not a ton of actual research done on the negative effects of MSG. And for the most part, there's for every argument that you find that argues for these negative uh, and sometimes neurological effects of MSG, you find a counter-argument that argues that in the dosages that we would take in in our diet, it shouldn't cause any problems. Um, yeah, yeah. Let me know if you have other things to add to the whole MSG story. Um, and, and even if it is personal stories, those are fun to add to. Fully learning the structures of all of the amino acids is going to be an adventure. Um, you're going to want to practice probably every day for a little while so that you're fully aware of all of the personalities of every one of the amino acids. I've also created this table that I'm hoping will be a little bit helpful to you. And one of the things that I want to first draw your attention to is the fact that although there are some confusing one-letter abbreviation for the amino acids, most of them are pretty straightforward. In fact, as you scan down, you'll find that it's really actually only seven of the amino acids that have strange abbreviations. We can begin with phenylalanine being the F and tyrosine Y tryptophan W, our aromatic amino acids. Some of the um, highly hydrophobic amino acids have abbreviations that are very, very, they make a lot of sense. But then when we look at the basic amino acids, you get to those that are not so sensical again, such as lysine and arginine and the acidic amino acids, aspartate, glutamate, and their amide derivatives, asparagine and glutamine. These are those that seem a little bit more confusing. So maybe you can star those in your table and you can take a little bit of extra time getting to know and love those. The other thing that I want to um, draw your attention to is that when we talk about polypeptide chains, when we talk about amino acid sequences, we're very tendent towards just writing them in a very simplistic way. So you may see a sequence that's something like F, V, I, L, L, and 
am, and so on forth. And being able to quickly look at that sequence and say to yourself, oh, there's a very hydrophobic uh, region in the polypeptide sequence is important. So being able to understand the personality of a full polypeptide chain or a region within a protein based upon the one letter abbreviations that you see for those amino acids, it's all part of speaking the language, all part of having a really sexy mind. So this is something that you're going to want to take a lot of time to learn. Post Post the structures of the amino acids somewhere you look frequently, post this table somewhere that you look very frequently so that you can really get to know these, um, these personalities of these amino acids and their uniquenesses. And I've tried to, to help you with some of that in characterizing these as being highly hydrophilic, highly hydrophobic, um, basic acidic, and so you really can understand the differences in personalities. Okay, that being said, really we do need to have more discussion about judging hydrophilicity and hydrophobicity. As we've talked about the hydrophilic or hydrophobic nature of these amino acids, you may have been a little bit confused as I said, well this one is more hydrophobic, this one is less hydrophobic, at, at determining relativity of the hydrophilicity. And that's where something called um, the hydropathy plot comes in or the hydropathy value of an amino acid. And the way that we determine hydropathy for an amino acid is to look at the free energy change. If you take an amino acid from a hydrophobic environment, say a membranous environment, and you drag it into a water-filled aqueous environment. If the amino acid is a water-loving amino acid, that's going to be a uh, favorable free energy change. That is, it is going to be negative free energy release. But if you drag a, a very water-hating amino acid from a membranous or hydrophobic environment into a water-filled environment, it's going to be a very positive or non-favorable free energy change. So this is the hydropathy value, the value that is measured when taking an amino acid from that hydrophobic environment to the hydrophilic environment. And we're, we're able to actually uh, give values of hydropathy on a hydropathy scale. Positive hydropathy values obviously mean really water hating. <laughs> um, yes, you know, they, they hate it when you take them from this water hating environment to the, the water filled aqueous environment. So it's very uh, non non-favorable value, positive value. Whereas a, a water-loving amino acid is like, woohoo, yeah, take me from this water-hating environment to the in aqueous environment, and they're going to have negative hydropathy values. So this is tabulated, and this is a table that has been adapted from your textbook, table 3.1, giving these hydropathy values. And of course, our expectations pan out that here's all of our highly hydrophobic amino acids like isoleucine, phenylalanine, valine, leucine, methionine, all of them having very positive positive hydropathy values. And then of course our highly hydrophilic basic and acidic amino acids and the amide derivatives of the acids, very low um, negative values, so negative 7.5 for arginine, extremely basic uh, charged amino acid, really, really water loving, so these highly negative values. Now in the middle somewhere are these, yeah, you know, I go either way, <laughs> kind of amino acids, where tyrosine, for example, is very near zero, so is proline. Um, um, tryptophan has a little bit of variability depending upon how it's measured and on what scale, but these are all setting at the center, not highly hydrophobic, not highly hydrophilic. So, you know, we can say threonine, we had mentioned that it was hydrophilic, but we said, oh, but it's not as hydrophilic as something like lysine. And here you can see that in a quantitative tabulated way. Now we utilize these values in a really effective um, means of trying to judge the sequential uh, personalities of amino acids in a polypeptide chain. And we can actually make what's called a hydropathy plot. So we can see um, a plot for the amino acids in sequential order within a polypeptide chain. And I actually want to draw a hydropathy plot so that we can start to familiarize ourselves with what that would look like. And think about how it would allow us to sort of understand the um, nature of a polypeptide chain. On the y-axis of a hydropathy plot, you put the hydropathy value. So we know that that's going to mean that we're going to need to put zero somewhere in the center here. 
because our highly hydrophobic amino acids are all going to be above zero and then our highly hydrophilic amino acids are all going to be below zero with those that are in the center kind of hovering around the zero mark. So then on the x-axis um, we're looking at um, position or amino acid number within the sequence. So we would recognize then, um, and actually, let's actually do this. Let's just do a fictional hydropathy plot. So we've got our position. Said another way, let's make sure we are all on the same level of understanding. Position one, position two, position three, AKA amino acid one, two, three. Meaning that if we're looking at an amino acid chain, beginning with the amino terminus of that chain, and then going, say we've got valine, isoleucine. Valine would be position one. Isoleucine would be position two. Leucine, position three. Uh, phenylalanine, position four. Right? That's what we're talking about, the position or amino acid number. Now, if we went ahead and drew a fictional hydropathy plot, and we just said, okay, this is going to look like this. Amino acid one has a value down here, two and three, maybe four, five, and so on forth. And then some of these in positions, so at six, seven, eight, they're kind of near zero, but then we've got these up here that are uh, in the positive hydropathy values, and then maybe hovering around zero here. So as we've seen this um, plot evolve, we can recognize that the amino acids that are in positions one, two, three, four, or five, and so on, these have um, very negative hydropathy values, meaning that the transition for them from the membranous environment into the water-filled environment was very favorable. So that means these must be very highly water-loving amino acids, maybe things like lysine and arginine and aspartate and glutamate. Whereas when we get to, what is it about position six or seven, we start to see that we're getting maybe things like proline and then we're getting into the amino acids for which the transition was not favorable. So these are going to have highly positive values, meaning that they're very highly hydrophobic. So it's interesting then to ask, could this hydropathy plot be for this polypeptide that I began writing over here? And of course the answer is unequivocally no, because these would be highly hydrophobic amino acids, meaning that our plot would have begun with values well above zero. So it's cool to be able to look at a sequence from a polypeptide ch peptide chain and be able to pick out the corresponding hydropathy plot, or likewise to be able to look at a hydropathy plot and then therefore being able to pick out the corresponding amino acid sequence for that polypeptide chain. So one of the ways in which this is very, very valuable is to allow researchers to identify within a polypeptide chain the membrane spanning region. So remember that if we've got a protein with a membrane spanning region, and just to remind everyone, I know this is old news for most, but here we've got a membrane, and if we're talking about a polypeptide that has multiple regions in it, and we'll have a little more discussion on this a little bit later, but let's say that it's got like this amino terminus maybe, and I'm going to get rid of our other sequence here so that we don't have anything in, in our way. So let's say that maybe we've got this polar region uh, of this amino acid chain that kind of hangs out out here. And then um, here's this like membrane spanning region. And then maybe there's this polar area that's inside the, um, inside of the, um, there goes my color change again, inside of the cytosol. And so it, it, a hydropathy plot could be super valuable for being able to find this membrane spanning region because we would expect these amino acids to be very water hating, um, enjoying poking their heads, right? The, the R groups would be poking right into the really hydrophobic tails 
of the bilayer. And so we would recognize the likelihood that this area here which shows the very high positive hydropathy values might be that membrane spanning region of very highly hydrophobic amino acids. So very commonly the hydropathy plot is utilized to identify membrane spanning regions within a polypeptide chain. So this is a really cool and very applied use for hydropathy plots.